Today we'll be thinking about the thought of Gilles Deleuze. Um, he's a pretty original thinker, so prepare yourself for uh, a bit of a rough ride. Uh, first we'll look at his, uh, his, his biography, uh, then we'll look at his metaphysics. Uh, specifically, we'll think about his idea of multiplicities as an alternative to substance, uh, his idea of event as an alternative to essence, and his idea of the virtual and the actual as an alternative to uh, possible and real. Uh, then we'll think about the implications of these ideas for politics. So we'll look at the way his metaphysical ideas give us a new way of thinking about things in terms of striated and smooth spaces, uh, in terms of state versus nomad, uh, in terms of deterritorialization versus uh, war machines, and finally uh, the concepts of lines of flight and assemblages. Gilles Deleuze was born in uh, 1925 in France. Um, he led a fairly sedate academic life. Um, it wasn't entirely sedate. Uh, probably the most dramatic event in his life occurred during the Second World War. Um, during the occupation of France, Deleuze's older brother was arrested by the Nazis for resistance activities uh, and he was deported and he ultimately died on the train to Auschwitz. Um, so this was, you know, this was obviously pretty traumatic for him. Um, but after this, it was more or less an academic career the whole way. Uh, he studied at the Sorbonne in 1944. Um, after passing his uh, aggregation in philosophy in 1948, he taught at various lycees in, in France. Uh, in 1957, he took up a position at the University of Paris. Uh, from 1960 to 64, he held a position at the Centre National de Recherche uh, Scientifique. Um, and from 1964 to 1969, he was a professor at the University of uh, Lyon. Uh, in 1969, he was appointed to the University of Paris 8 at Vincennes Saint-Denis, uh, which was an experimental school organized to implement educational reform. And actually, this, un this uh, new university drew uh, a number of very talented scholars, including Foucault, who was in fact the person who suggested um, that they hire Deleuze, as well as the psychoanalyst Felix Guattari, um, who was a big collaborator of Deleuze's. Uh, so Deleuze taught at Vincennes until his retirement in uh, 1987. Uh, he died in 1995. Um, he'd suffered from respiratory ailments from a young age and developed tuberculosis in, in 1968, where he went uh, or underwent a, a thoracoplasty, a, a lung removal. Um, he suffered increasingly severe respiratory symptoms for the rest of his life, and in the last years of his life, simple tasks such as handwriting actually required a laborious effort. Uh, so ultimately in 1995, he committed suicide, um, throwing himself from the window of his apartment. Deleuze was a phenomenally original thinker, um, though he in fact spent much of his career writing books on other philosophers, uh, such as Hume, Spinoza, uh, Kant, and uh, Nietzsche. However, he developed highly, uh, highly idiosyncratic uh, interpretations of these thinkers, and, uh, uh, and these interpretations ended up forming the basis of his own philosophical system, or metaphysical system. Now, Deleuze, like many of the philosophers we've been discussing in the last couple of weeks, um, has an influence that reaches beyond philosophy. Um, he's he's uh, referenced and used in architecture, in urban studies, in geography, in film studies, musicology, anthropology, uh, gender studies, uh, literary studies, and many, many other fields. Okay, so we'll be looking at, you know, Deleuze in this course, obviously in the context of international relations, but he's primarily, uh, primarily a metaphysician. A metaphysician. Um, so he's interested in the first principles of things. He's interested in the fundamental nature of reality, um, of uh, fundamental nature of concepts, of identity, and all these different kinds of things. Uh, and we'll be looking at some of his metaphysics today, uh, primarily because his metaphysical views um, and his views on politics are really deeply um, related, so you can't really understand one without the other. But they are quite tricky. He is a very tricky thinker. Um, so my aim here is to give you a general idea um, about some of the most essential concepts um, in Deleuze's metaphysics, um, to give you this kind of broad brush understanding of his uh, metaphysical system, um, so you can then have a sense of where he's coming from in terms of his uh, politics.
So in his, uh, in his magnum opus uh, called A Difference in Repetition, he tries to develop a metaphysics that he considers adequate to, uh, to contemporary mathematics and science. Um, so in other words, he doesn't consider previous metaphysical systems um, to really support, to really uh, capture or express the insights of modern uh, science. Uh, so he wants to develop a metaphysics that does. Um, and this is something that's actually quite interesting about him, um, because other post-structuralist theorists that we've looked at in this course, um, and who were actually contemporaries of his at the Sorbonne, um, so Derrida, Baudrillard, um, Foucault, um, all of these uh, theorists, they tended to study and base their ideas on the metaphysicians such as Hegel um, or Heidegger. Um, Deleuze, on the other hand, and given you know the context especially, um, was quite radical in that he focused instead on David Hume and the, the philosophy of empiricism. Uh, so empiricism is basically the view that all knowledge uh, is based on experience that's derived from the senses. Um, and this is, this, you know, among his contemporaries in his context, this was not a popular view at all. Uh, so he was kind of a rebel here. Now, in his metaphysics, what he wants to do is he wants to replace the concept of substance with that of multiplicity. He wants to replace essence with event. And he wants to uh, replace possibility or potentiality um, with the idea of virtuality. And you'll go through all of these in turn and, and hopefully give you a better idea of what he actually means by this. <clears throat> so the basic idea in Deleuze's metaphysics is the inversion of the traditional metaphysical relationship between identity and difference. Um, so traditionally, uh, difference was seen as uh, derived from identity. Uh, so for example, if you say X is different from Y, um, then that means we have this relatively stable thing called X. Um, it has certain qualities. Um, and we've got this relatively stable thing Y. And that has also certain qualities. And we derive the difference between the two things uh, by comparing these qualities and seeing what is not the same uh, between X and Y, um, which sounds kind of pretty commonsensical, right? Um, I mean, a trivial example like I've got here, uh, we compare a, uh, a carrot cake and a chocolate cake. Um, so you've got this thing that exists. It's a carrot cake. Um, it has a certain identity. It's made up of certain qualities. Uh, and then we have this thing uh, with the identity of chocolate cake. It also has particular qualities. Um, and we put these two identities, these two sets of qualities, side by side. And then we look at the gap between them, what's not the same between them, and that's difference. So we, we, uh, so we have identity first, and then difference is the gap between these two identities, between the sets of qualities that things actually have. Uh, you know, this again, it sounds really commonsensical, but Deleuze wants to overturn this idea. He wants to make difference the primary thing and identity derivative of difference. <clears throat> so how does he do this? One of the key ideas for understanding the way that Deleuze overturns uh, the identity difference um, relationship is his concept of the multiplicity. Um, and the way that his concept of the multiplicity rejects the theory, uh, the philosophy of Platonism. Uh, so for Deleuze, um, and for uh, Nietzsche as well, and for uh, Henry Bergson, um, who Deleuze draws on quite explicitly to develop his own ideas, um, human beings and you know, the human mind, it simplifies the world. Um, so one of the reasons it does this arguably, uh, is because that's actually, it's really useful for human survival, for human flourishing, if the human mind simplifies the world that it encounters. Uh, so for instance, you know, let's say we're wandering through um, the, uh, the forest, and we need some food. Uh, and we see a blueberry bush, right? Now the fact is that every blueberry on every blueberry bush is actually a singular thing, right? Um, Every blueberry is just itself, um, um, and every blueberry we ever encounter in our lives is ultimately just, it, it is itself. It's a, it's a unique, particular thing, right? In the real world, we never encounter the concept of blueberry. Um, we never encounter you know, such a thing as blueberry in general. Um, we encounter this blueberry, or we encounter that blueberry. We encounter particular uh, blueberries. 
But that's not how we think about things. That's not how our mind works. Um, instead, we apprehend um, this blueberry or that blueberry as a blueberry in general. Um, and the reason why, arguably, is because this is, is really useful to us. We treat these quite unique instances um, as examples of the concept blueberry, as uh, reproductions um, or expressions, because this is just simpler from our point of view. It allows us to know that this blueberry and that blueberry um, are edible and they're going to provide us with some nutrition and, and so on. Um, because if our mind had to pay attention to um, and to understand um, every blueberry as the singular, unique, particular uh, thing, then it would just be way, way harder to know whether we should eat it or not, right? Um, so our mind imposes this order of concepts onto the world. And so we get this common sense belief that human concepts end up matching um, the things that exist naturally in the world. Now, Platonism, this is Plato here, um, as a metaphysical view of, uh, of the nature of objects and concepts, um, codifies this common sense kind of view. So the basic idea with Platonism is that there's the one and there's the many. Uh, so the one is this fundamental, perfect idea of a thing. Um, you know, so there's this idea, there's this perfect uh, concept of blueberry. Um, and every real blueberry is just an instance of this, or a copy of this ideal, uh, usually a, a bad copy of this ideal, an imperfect copy. It's an inferior copy of this perfect concept. So every blueberry is an instance of the idea of blueberry. Every blueberry is uh, uh, an expression of uh, blueberry in general. And this kind of way of thinking about things kind of reassures us that the world around us is um, uh, what matches the concepts that we use to understand it. Because it tells us that our own, our own patterns, our own way of ordering things, our own way of making sense of things actually transcends the world. It's this thing that that actually exists in the world, these concepts. Uh, but Deleuze is going to, you know, he wants to say, no, this is not uh, the world that we actually inhabit. Uh, we can't mistake our own concepts, these ideas, for uh, something that actually exists in the world itself. Uh, we live in this world, he thinks, of manifest difference. Um, we don't live in a world that fundamentally is ordered by concepts. That's something that we come up with. It's not something that is in the world. So there are only uh, singular, specific blueberries. There are no, you know, there's no such thing as, um, you know, this imperfect instance of the idea of blueberry. Um, blueberries, you know, everything is just itself. Our world is then um, a world in which everything that we encounter is singular. Everything we encounter is unique, um, and it only seems like um, uh, there are these things uh, in general. Uh, because we impose that order on reality. It's what, uh, an activity of our own mind. <clears throat> so instead of ideas, instead of concepts, um, instead of things in general, Deleuze describes the world as being made up of what he calls multiplicities. Uh, multiplicities are made up of... Um, the relations between elements. Um, so a particular blueberry um, is, is going to be a multiplicity. Um, it's not this expression of a concept. It's not um, a model. It's not a copy. Um, it's simply this combination of relations between things arranged in a particular way. Now, one thing I want to, to note here is that Deleuze is not saying that uh, the idea of multiplicity simply draws attention to the fact that you can break things up into parts, because that's kind of obvious, right? Um, and this is kind of a subtle but, but ultimately quite important difference. Um, if we thought of things in that way, um, you know, we've got this idea, we've got this thing, uh, we've got a blueberry, um, and we, we think, okay, well, we can divide this blueberry up into various components. So we can have a blueberry, blueberries are made up of X and Y and Z um, components. That, for Deleuze, is not what he means by multiplicity. And the reason why is because this way of looking at things presumes a unity from the start. So we begin with this idea of blueberry, and then we fragment the idea of blueberry into different bits. 
right? So this is a kind of top-down way of understanding um, things as, as, as fragments. So we, we assume a unity, we assume a concept, we assume an idea of something at the start, and then we try to work out what um, components go into creating that idea or that concept or that um, uh, you know, th thing. So we try to work out what, um, perhaps what fragments in general uh, make up a particular thing in general. So what we want to think about instead is multiplicity as a group of things uh, in which there are certain determinate relationships possible um, between various things. Um, now one way we can think about this perhaps is, is the idea of a set or contrasting it with the idea of a set um, because a set is always um, composed in relationship to something external. Um, so you know, again using uh, this, this idea of blueberries, um, we could have a set of blueberries and we could put in that set everything that is a blueberry, right? Um, but it's the concept berry, uh, the criteria that determines whether something goes in that set or not, um, that is external to the set itself, that's not inside the set. Deleuze's idea of a multiplicity by contrast is not made up of a collection of things grouped together um, due to their you know, being determined by some external concept. Uh, instead, a multiplicity is made up solely due to the internal relations between the various components of that thing. Um, so a set is made up um, of the things in that set um, by whether or not you know, a particular thing has a particular identity um, a particular quality maybe or a particular characteristic um, but a multiplicity is just made up of the relationships between various elements so there are certain principles certain laws that determine the uh, the relations or maybe the possibilities of relations between these elements uh, and it's these rela these particular relations or these possibilities of relations um, of which a multiplicity is composed and that determine the nature of a particular multiplicity. <clears throat> okay, so what are the objects, what are the elements um, that make up a particular multiplicity? Well, for Deleuze, um, these two, uh, you know, th these as well, they're not thought of as having a, uh, uh, a form or an identity or an essence. Um, the objects, the elements of a multiplicity um, are themselves determined solely by the relations that they can and do enter into with other, uh, with other elements. So in other words, the, uh, the elements of a multiplicity just are those relations that they enter into with other elements. That is just what they are. Um, uh, as well as the relations that they could enter, that they have the power to enter into. So uh, you know, in this context, it's the relations that's foregrounded. It's not the identity of a thing, it's the relations that a thing is entered into. So we're not saying there are things here um, and therefore we've got relationships between these things that exist. Instead we're saying there are relationships um, and therefore there are things. So the things are derived from the relationships, not the other way around. So this, you know, this is tricky. This is really hard because it completely flips around um, the usual way of thinking about metaphysics, our common sense view of metaphysics. Uh, you know, now, everyday lives, we just think of identity coming first um, and difference, the relationships between things um, being derived from identity. Um, but instead, in Deleuze's view, again, the relationships come first, the relations are first, and then what things are uh, is merely the sum total of the relations that a thing enters into either actually or, or virtually. And yeah, this is a really quite a heady uh, inversion, I think. I think it's a really difficult uh, thing to get your head around. Um, because we are, we're just completely used to thinking in terms of identity. Um, but this is quite key to Deleuze. This is really key. Uh, a thing consists of its relations. It isn't a thing that exists outside relations and enters into them. Um, it doesn't have a particular form, it doesn't have a particular nature, and then enters into relations. It just is those relations. Whew, okay, so 
a multiplicity then it isn't a copy of a one of this idea of this concept um, it's not an instance of a general kind um, and you know as I said it's also not the idea of something being able to be um, divided because a multiplicity is not made up of fragments it's not made up of parts um, because if it were then we'd still be assuming that that thing has an identity um, before it's divided um, so we'd already be assuming a unity we'd already be assuming a whole we'd already be assuming that it's in some way a copy of an idea or a, or a, or a concept or a thing in general instead then a multiplicity um, is the relations of um, elements in what Deleuze calls a unique event. So this is what I was talking about before when I said that Deleuze wants to replace essence with event uh, in, his, in his metaphysics. So traditional metaphysics, um, as I've mentioned, um, sees things in terms of categories and in terms of concepts. Um, and everything that exists, therefore, has an essence. Um, so uh, if we're thinking about this in the context of international relations, we might think about the state and would ask, okay, so uh, what is the essence of, uh, of a state, of the state as a concept? Um, what is the state? You know, what makes it what it is? What fundamental qualities um, uh, make a state a state rather than, you know, a multinational corporation or something like that, right? So everything that exists, a multinational corporation has an essence, a state has an essence, and the difference between them is that those essences differ. They have different qualities or sets of qualities that make up what they are. And this takes us back to the idea, I think, of identity and difference. Because when we think of things in this way, um, when we think in terms of essences, then we have two things with identity. You know, we've got the corporation and the state. Um, and we say, you know, given their essence, given their qualities, um, given what they are, how can we tell the difference between these two things? Uh, and in this case, we're proceeding from identity to difference. But Deleuze, um, you know, with his concept of multiplicities, he wants to throw out the idea of essence. Um, he says there's just no such thing. Uh, each individual thing that we uh, call a state um, is not some unity. Every state is a multiplicity. Um, it's in its, in its singularity, um, not as an instance of a general kind, the relations between elements are arranged in a particular way. Um, and importantly for Deleuze also, not just in a particular way, but at a particular time. So, you know, in other words, if there's no essence, if all we have, if all everything is um, a multiplicity, um, then the world has to be made up of events instead of essences. So essences, they continue through time, right? A state contains the essence of stateness, uh, and this essence underlies the particular state um, that we're talking about um, at any particular time, and this essence yeah, continues through time. So the state continues with this particular essence. Um, so, you know, at moment one, state, um, uh, a state is a certain way, um, and at moment two, it's slightly different, perhaps. Um, but at both moments, it still has this same essence. It still um, has the essence of statedness. If something is a multiplicity, though, <coughs> then it's the relations between the various elements that matters. Um, uh, and this, these relations are, are things that occur at a particular moment in time. They don't continue through time. Um, they occur at a particular moment. Um, so if a particular multiplicity that we call a state is a relation of elements um, in a particular relationship at time one um, and a particular relation of elements um, in a particular relationship at time two, um, then it's not the same thing at both times. Um, so we have to think of multiplicity instead as an event, right? something that exists and occurs at a particular time that doesn't continue through time in a really simple kind of way. So a multiplicity occurs at time one. A different multiplicity, though related in particular ways, uh, occurs at time two. 
Now, this doesn't mean, of course, that a particular multiplicity that's uh, made up of particular relations um, between particular things uh, can't be relatively stable over time. Um, but it does mean that you can only understand that stability in terms of the particular set of relations between elements, not as the stability of that thing's essence. Um, you know, not the stability of a concept or a quality that embodies the identity of that thing over time. Okay, so this takes us to his idea, or his attempt to replace the idea of potential or possible um, with that of virtual. So if something has potential, um, in, in a kind of a traditional metaphysical view, uh, we usually think of it as having a particular quality. Um, so an acorn, it has the potential to become an oak tree, for example, right? Um, because it has the quality of the potential to become an oak tree, possesses that particular quality. For Deleuze, though, this is just kind of um, a confused way of looking at things. Um, and it's a method that can't really work, he thinks, in metaphysics. Um, uh, and particularly in a metaphysics, uh, particularly in an ontology, uh, in which identity is derived from difference um, and not the other way around. Because it's only when we're thinking in terms of identity and in terms of essence that we can assert that something has the quality of the potential to be wise. So an oak tree or an acorn has the quality of the potential to be um, an oak tree. Um, the whole basis of this view completely trades on the reality of concepts or the reality of ideas, the reality of, of platonic forms. It assumes that, that this stable thing over time with an essence that becomes this other stable thing over time uh, also with an essence. Um, Deleuze also thinks it just gets things the wrong way round. Um, the idea with the acorn and the oak tree is that the oak tree exists um, in the beginning potentially as, um, uh, potentially, sorry, in the acorn. Um, and later, it gains reality. So in the future, it, 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 at the start, it, it exists potentially, uh, and later on, it exists um, in reality. But Deleuze says, when you really push at this theory, it kind of works the other way around. It doesn't um, work by addition. It actually kind of works by, subs by uh, subtraction. So we have this um, thing that exists, we have this thing that has being, um, and then we subtract away that being, um, and through the subtraction, we get the quality of potential being. So when we say that an acorn has the potential to become an oak tree, um, we're first thinking of an oak tree, then we're subtracting being from that oak tree, and we're attributing that oak tree without being to the acorn as a property. Or, you know, we, to take another example, we could say, um, you know, Jane has the potential to be a world-class cricket player. Um, but what, what I'm actually doing here is I'm, I'm taking Jane as a world-class cricket player, as a concept or an idea. I'm subtracting being from that. I'm subtracting the existence of that. Um, and then I'm attributing that lack to Jane, that potentiality to Jane as a quality. Uh, so I'm saying Jane has the quality of world-class world -class cricket player without being or without existence. Um, and that's, when you think about it, a pretty weird way of looking at things, right? Um, it gets things the wrong way around, um, and particularly if we're trying to understand how things change over time. It's sort of, uh, it's just working backwards. You can't explain change over time simply by taking the final state, subtracting being from that final state, and then attributing that to, as a quality to the earlier state. Um, that's, that's just lazy thinking, Deleuze thinks. Um, you're not actually adding anything to that picture. You're just moving things around in a way that's actually not very helpful. And that's quite a strange way uh, of looking at things, he, he thinks. So he rejects this metaphysics of possibility. Um, he thinks it doesn't make sense on its own terms, um, and it's not really useful for a metaphysics of difference over identity and a metaphysics of um, event over essence. Instead, then, he replaces the dichotomy of possible and real with virtual and actual. 
for Deleuze, everything that exists, every multiplicity, um, has two sides. It has the virtual and the actual. Um, the actual is the qualities or the extensities, um, so the extension in space, um, that an object has as, as a result of the current relations that the elements have entered into. Um, the virtual, by contrast, that is the relations that could obtain between the elements. So given the current relations and the rules and the laws and the principles governing those relations, the virtual is all of the relations that um, the elements can enter into. Now, this may sound at first like it's a restatement of this idea of potential. Um, it isn't. It's not a, a, a it's not possibility. It's not potential. Um, because possibility implies that something has a particular essence um, that contains the quality potential to be Y. Um, the virtual is not a quality that a thing possesses in its essence. Um, it's, a, it's simply a different, or the different ways that the elements of a multitude could rearrange given the particular powers that they have. Uh, so it's, it's ways that the internal topology of an object can rearrange um, in theory, in principle. So it's not about um, relations between entities. Um, if it were, we'd be slipping back into this metaphysics of, uh, of substance. Um, in the virtual, it's the relational that's foregrounded here. It's about the ways that the internal structure of a thing um, could reorganize. Now, as I mentioned before as well, um, the, the virtual for Deleuze is um, a side of an object. So he wants to say that the virtual and the actual um, are actually both real. Um, he's drawing their distinction in a different way than we would usually uh, draw this, this kind of distinction. And the reason he does this is because given a particular internal structure, a uh, particular set of relations between elements, um, all the other relations um, that an element or the elements could enter into are actually part of that object itself. Um, not as a quality of the object, but as something that could arise from the current relations in theory, in principle, due to the powers um, that inhere in those relations. Um, these powers, of course, are constituted themselves by the relations that elements have entered into. Because remember, the relations come first and the elements come out of that. And again, this is, a, this is quite a tricky point, um, but think of it maybe like this. Deleuze, he's privileging difference, he's, pri he's privileging, re uh, privileging relations over identity. So he hasn't started with objects and then he's seen what relations they've entered into. He starts with relations, um, and those relations then constitute the elements of the object. And then those relations, of course, in c constituting those elements, then constitute uh, those elements with certain powers. Um, so the virtual is those powers. It consists in those powers. The ways that those relations constitute the internal topology of an object such that it could rearrange uh, because of the powers given to the elements by the relations that they've entered into. All right, so in short, the virtual is not the actual. Um, it isn't the um, actual qualities or extensities of the object itself. Um, as a matter of fact, but the virtual is also part of the object because the relations um, of which the object is constituted, uh, constituted could at any time rearrange to give rise to actualize this virtual. Okay, so multiplicities are uh, these objects constituted by internal relations between elements and consist in both the actual as well as the virtual um, relations between these elements. We can then divide multiplicities into two different kinds. And this is where it starts to get particularly relevant to international relations. Um, you won't see why immediately, but we'll, we'll get to it. Um, so he says there are continuous and there are discontinuous multiplicities. In the case of a discontinuous multiplicity, the relations between the elements of the multiplicity uh, mean that change to that multipl uh, multiplicity consists in a process of division. 
Um, so for instance, he would say a glass of water is a discontinuous multiplicity. Um, yeah, a glass of water, it's homogenous, right? Because if you divide a glass of water um, into two glasses, you get the same thing in both glasses. Um, the water is the same temperature, it does the same things, it's basically the same stuff. You've divided the multiplicity then, but you haven't changed its nature, you haven't changed what it is. The relations between the elements of it remain exactly the same. By contrast, a continuous multiplicity consists in a multiplicity in which change to the relations leads to a change in what the multiplicity is or what the multiplicity does. So if you changed the, uh, the relations between the elements of a human body, for, for example, um, you would change that thing. It would no longer be what it is. It wouldn't be a human body anymore. Um, so for this reason, he calls uh, uh, continuous multiplicities uh, heterogeneous because they become different things depending on, on what happens to their own um, internal relations, their own internal uh, topology. Okay, so there's no question here that all of this is, is extremely difficult, it's extremely challenging. Um, I've, I've published on Deleuze and I still find him really, really hard. Um, but I think the difficulty um, that uh, people have when they engage with Deleuze um, actually speaks to why it's really important to look at metaphysics, um, even when we're studying something that's as seemingly uh, distant as international relations. Now, I'm not saying here that the fact that something is difficult means that it's automatically worthwhile. That would be, that would be ridiculous. Um, but I think it's worth thinking about why Deleuze's metaphysics are so challenging. And one reason, I think, um, is that we already have a metaphysics, right? We have the platonic metaphysics um, that we just take for granted, that we just learn um, from our culture. Um, We've just learned, we've picked up the Platonic metaphysics without even realizing it. And so when we encounter Deleuze's metaphysics, um, then there's this clash, right? It doesn't fit with our basic, really basic way of understanding how the world works. But you can, you can pretty much bet that Platonic metaphysics, right, the metaphysics that we take for granted, um, is actually just as complicated and just as difficult as Deleuze's uh, view uh, is. Um, it's just that we've, already, or, we've all already learned this metaphysics, right? It's like learning a language, right? If you grow up with uh, English and you try to learn Mandarin, uh, then Mandarin just seems really difficult, really complicated. Um, but it's no more complicated, obviously, than English is, uh, because if you'd grown up with Mandarin, you'd think that English was the really difficult, really complicated uh, uh, language. So I think the difficulty in uh, a metaphysics like Deleuze's here um, actually speaks to the way that uh, at the most basic level, uh, we've taken, we, we have this taken for granted way of viewing the world, of making sense of uh, the way things are. So our basic ways of understanding uh, what reality itself consists in is something that itself is learned like a language is learned. And I think it's pretty obvious, too, that your metaphysics, the way that you understand reality, the, you know, what you think reality is, how it works, at this really basic level, um, is going to make thinking about some things, um, thinking about, you know, let's say we're thinking about IR, um, uh, possible or, or at least obvious. It's going to lead us to think certain ways about certain things. Um, and it's going to actually preclude thinking about things in other ways. It's going to make certain theories possible and obvious, and it's going to make um, uh, others um, unobvious. It's going to rule even some of them out of contention to begin with. They're just going to be completely ridiculous. So metaphysics may seem like it's this really distant thing from international relations, um, but I think in this way, in some ways, it actually gets really to the heart of it. Because if you don't get the metaphysics right, then you can't get the right theory of IR to begin with. It's just not going to happen. So with all of this as framing, <coughs> what kind of IR theory um, does Deleuze's metaphysics make possible? Well, 
for one thing, his idea of the discontinuous multiplicity and the um, and the continuous, uh, sorry, discontinuous homogeneous multiplicity and the and the continuous heterogeneous multiplicity, um, it's taken up in a pretty definite way in his political theory. Um, so Deleuze distinguishes between two different ways of relating to space. Um, we have that of the state, and we have that of the nomad. The space he thinks organizes, uh, sorry, the state, sorry, organizes space as striated. Um, it sees it as divisible, it sees it as discontinuous. So you can divide space as many times as you like, um, just like you can divide a glass of water, and you're not changing its fundamental nature. So the state treats uh, space as a discontinuous, homogeneous multiplicity. It divides space, but that division doesn't lead to thinking of new spaces as fundamentally distinct. Uh, they're just instances of the same thing, right? Um, uh, the, the space of or the space within uh, the state. So the way that politics works um, on this model is that the state centrally manages space by dividing it and then assigning to these homogeneous spaces purposes or roles. Um, so in New Zealand, you know, the, space, uh, the state divides space and says, all right, this space is, is for housing, um, this space is assigned to commerce, you know, this space is a public space, this space over here is a, um, is a, is a uh, you know, public park, this is where the government buildings are, uh, and so on. Right? So it controls space through this division and then this assignation, this assigning to space its particular roles, its particular qualities. The really important thing here, though, is you can only assign roles to space. You can only assign roles to space um, if you see space as relatively homogeneous, right? as basically all the same, um, because you're imposing the role, you're imposing the purpose on that space. Now, the nomad, by contrast, um, socially organizes space for Deleuze as a continuous heterogeneous multiplicity. Um, and Deleuze calls this smooth space. So in a smooth space, uh, the nomad can move um, wherever they like, so it's not this rigidly demarcated um, and defined um, space you know, by a centralized state. Um, you know, the, the idea is that because the space is smooth rather than striated, divided up and assigned, um, the nomad is just completely free to move around within it. They don't own the space, um, and, and they have no assigned place within that space. Now, one thing to keep in mind here is, is to a certain extent, Deleuze uses the term nomad as, as a metaphor. Um, but he does actually also mean actual real nomads. Um, so think about that kind of life. Right? If you're living on the Mongolian steppes, no one owns the steppes. No one owns that space. No one has decided that this space um, belongs to this purpose, and this space belongs to that purpose, um, and this space over here belongs to a third purpose. Right? No one has imposed an order onto that space. Instead, you move around within that space, not according to the way that the space has been divided and assigned um, by a central authority, but instead according to the nature of that space itself, right? And this is where the heterogeneity, uh, so heterogeneity uh, of smooth space becomes, I think, a bit more obvious. This way of looking at space sees each bit of space as different from each other bit of space. Every bit of space is unique. If spaces are all unique, if they're striated, um, you can divide it, Oh, sorry, if space, is, um, if space is striated, you can divide it, and, and each part is basically going to be the same. It's like, again, dividing a glass of water. Uh, the only difference between different spaces is what order you've imposed onto those spaces. But when you relate to space as smooth, you're attentive to the actual qualities of that, spake, of that space um, uh, a, you know, as, a unique, uh, as a unique piece of space. Um, so this gives you heterogeneous spaces rather than homogeneous spaces. Each bit of space is different from each other bit of space. 
So if you're a nomad, you're going to be attentive to this heterogeneous reality um, of each bit of smooth space. Uh, you know, di different bits of space are going to be good for different things. You know, if you live as a nomad, if you live in smooth space, um, then the local distributions within that space have to be understood if you want to survive. Right? Each, each bit of space we think of perhaps as a micro environment. And that micro environment, well, it may offer a good place to, uh, to pasture your flocks. It may offer shelter um, and somewhere to sleep. Um, you know, it may be a good place to get water uh, and so on. Right? But for the state, the nature of the space is more or less unimportant. It's all homogenous. It's all distinguished only through uh, the power and authority of the state in imposing a purpose on that space. For the nomad, by contrast, the nature of that space, that is all important. It's heterogeneous. Uh, it's distinguished by the specific qualities of that space, uh, by the feel of that space, as a unique micro-environment. Now, for Deleuze, that way of relating, the, these different ways of relating to space, um, give us two very different ways of waging war. So he thinks the state wages war by trying to conserve and to integrate its power to, to treat space as homogenous, its ability to divide space and assign a particular uh, purpose to these homogenous spaces. So in this way, the state brings the ability to produce, the ability to live, um, within the body of the state itself, because it's through the state's power and the state's authority um, that space, that's already been made homogenous by the state, can be assigned a role in this bureaucratic mechanism um, of society. So all social production um, for the centralized kind of state um, society ultimately comes out of the ability of the state to divide and to organize uh, space within its overall bureaucratic uh, system. And Deleuze calls this process deterritorialization. So it takes uh, what was before unique, uh, you know, singular, heterogeneous space with particular qualities, um, and by wiping out, you know, figuratively, not, not literally, that space's heterogeneous nature, by making that space homogeneous, it brings that state within itself. It brings that, state, uh, that space within uh, the body of the state. But nomads, of course, they rely on the heterogeneity of smooth space in order to live. They can't live without that. Um, nomads and other sort of non-centralized societies, they find their means of production, as I've said, in the specific locality of the land and, you know, in relating to and responding to these particular microenvironments. So deterritorialization, that's a deep, deep threat to the nomad. Uh, it undermines their very ability to live, to, to, to survive. So that's, that's the way that um, uh, the, the state wages war. Nomads, by contrast, um, they um, wage war with what Deleuze calls war machines. Um, now, by war machines, he doesn't mean he doesn't mean this kind of thing. He doesn't mean tanks. He doesn't mean planes. Um, he doesn't mean giant robots. Um, war machines instead are modes of organisation that are innovative, um, so that arise kind of spontaneously out of the non-bureaucratic, the flexible, localised form of, ni uh, of life um, of nomads. So these modes of organisation. They are uh, deeply opposed to the striated spaces that states, uh, that states sorry, seek to impose onto the world, uh, because they fundamentally arise from smooth space, right? from attentiveness to particular microenvironments and the heterogeneity um, of space and, and social production. So a Deleuzean account of politics, then, um, including international relations, sees it as fundamentally a conflict between the state's attempt to deterritorialize space, to make it homogenous, to make it striated, and then 
bring it in, in, and social production as well um, within the bureaucratic body of the state um, and within its you know, organizational control. Um, and the nomad, including actual nomads, but, but, but not simply um, actual nomads, that exist outside of state control, that exist locally, um, that exist in these smooth spaces, um, their ability to resist the power of the state with these innovative modes of social organization um, that prevent this deterritorialization. So the more, though, the more that the state seeks to impose this rigid bureaucratic uh, reality on society, the more it tries to homogenize space, um, the more that it actually opens itself up um, to possibilities of escape. Um, and the reason for this is that no bureaucratic system can ever completely circumscribe its elements, right? So in the same way that this metaphysics of identity uh, tries to impose uh, a single reality onto something that, you know, or onto a group of things that in reality are actually distinct, singular uh, objects, the state's uh, deterritorialization tries to impose um, uh, this bureaucratic order on unique, specific environments and objects. And it can never get it right then. So something is always going to escape that imposition. Things are not going to match up to the concepts, to the ideas, uh, to the bureaucratic systems of organization that um, have been imposed on that reality. Because reality isn't made up of objects um, with an essence. They're made up of, or it's made up of, objects with, with singular, uh, uh, or objects that are singular multiplicities. Um, so you, you know, if you impose an order, um, well, that singularity ultimately still remains, um, and that singularity is ultimately going to be outside that order. The possibilities of escape, then, based in this kind of remainder and what's left out of the bureaucratic organizing um, and what escapes uh, the ordering of the state, um, Deleuze calls lines of flight. So lines of flight, um, he thinks, exist within groups um, and within individuals as virtual tendencies. Um, so, you know, in other words, they exist as ways in which the internal topologies of, uh, of those groups and those individuals could be actualized by being explored in practice by these groups and these individuals. So when a line of flight, he, he says, is actualized, um, we get what Deleuze calls an assemblage. Um, an assemblage is basically a, uh, a set of interrelated processes which actualize the virtual tendencies of, of a particular multiplicity. So in other words, an assemblage is, is, an assemblage is what you get when the virtual tendencies of a multiplicity, um, which remember, you know, these virtual tendencies are always real, even though they're not actual, um, are actualized along a line of flight. So when you, when you have um, uh, virtual tendencies actualized along a line of flight, um, that is, a multi uh, that is a, um, an assemblage, sorry. Um, so when you get um, uh, virtual tendencies of, multi of a multiplicity that are actualized in a way that escapes the ordering of the state, you have an assemblage. Now, importantly, assemblages are not things that are imposed uh, from above. So in the same way that a multiplicity is, is different from um, you know, things that are members of a set, um, just remember, uh, you know, uh, a set is created due to this sort of transcendent idea or, or concept or, or identity, um, and a multiplicity, uh, by contrast, is uh, purely the relations between things um, and and the things that are constituted as well by those relations. Um, so an assemblage instead arises due to the virtual tendencies of the object, um, you know, in this case the individual or the group, uh, and not because of some external ordering principle. Right? So assemblages are in this way, they're self-organizing. They're not organized by an external idea or a concept. So I mean, a way of thinking about this in the context of international relations is things like um, you know, a class politics, or um, uh, you know, any of these any of these key concepts and ideas 
that we use to think about and organize conflict and international relations so far in this course, all the ways we've thought about it. Um, if we're thinking in terms of that top-down imposition, um, that's not what he's talking about. Instead, it's the self-organizing um, uh, actualizations of, of virtual tendencies of groups or individuals. So in this way, then, Deleuze's philosophy actually offers you know, quite a strikingly new way of understanding politics. Um, you know, politics for him, and particularly political resistance, um, comes out of this self or, you know, these self-organizing uh, assemblages that are created by the actualization of these virtual tendencies in a social group in response to the ordering activities of the state. And these tendencies are a matter of the, they're a matter of the, uh, the internal topology, the relations that constitute the nature of that group to begin with. So you've got a group, that group is made up of particular relations among elements and members, um, and those uh, relations have virtual tendencies, and then they can spontaneously self-organize in a way that escapes the, uh, the ordering um, processes of the state. Now, as I've said, you know, this is undoubtedly a really challenging, really difficult way of looking at things. Um, but I think it's a pretty interesting one as well, and it's definitely a distinctive way of understanding uh, international relations and, and uh, international politics. Um, of course, I'm sure you're going to have lots of questions in tutorial. Um, there's lots to talk about here. Um, so let's take this up again next week. Uh, we'll stop there, though, unless you have any questions. I think we have a couple of minutes. No, we don't. Um, so we'll take this up again in tutorial. Next week, we're going to start looking at feminist uh, 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 theorists, in particular, Simone de Beauvoir and Judith uh, Butler. So I'll see some of